This video is a ministry of Chesapeake Church, located in Huntingtown, Maryland. We thank you for watching and hope that this helps you grow into a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Good morning, Chesapeake Church. Let's stand and let's worship our God this morning. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm short, praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water. Church, let's say that. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. No, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? church we have so many reasons to praise our god this morning let's sing it i'll praise because you're sovereign praise because you reign praise because you rose and defeated the grave i'll praise because you're faithful praise because you're true praise because there's nobody greater than you i'll praise because you're sovereign praise because you reign praise because you rose and defeated the grave i'll praise because you're faithful Cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody Come on, let's sing you. Praise the Lord Oh my soul Continue to worship his name this morning. I know who I am, because I know who you are. The cross of salvation was only the star. 
now I am chosen, free and forgiven, and I have a future, and it's worth the living. Cause I was made to be tending a grave I was called by name Born and raised back to life again I was made for more So why would I make a bed in my shame When a fountain of grace is running my way I know I am yours and I was made for more cause I know who I am cause I know who you are the cross of salvation was only the star
to life again oh, I was made for more So why would I make what's in So why would I make A bed in my shame When a fountain of grace Is running my way I know I am yours I was made for more Walking around these walls, I thought my loud they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never
promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my worship you this morning for your faithfulness. We thank you that you never fail us. Your promises are true, God. We give this morning to you. We love you. Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. My name is Kristen, and if it's your first Sunday with us, we are so glad that you're here, and we truly want Chesapeake to be a place where you and your family can grow and get connected. After service, I will be out in the lobby with our Connections team and would love the opportunity to meet you. There, we can also help you fill out a Let Us Know card, which lets us know how to best connect with you. And you can also stay up to date with all that is going on around here at chesapeakechurch.org connect or right on our church app. And if you don't have our church app, now is a great time to go ahead and download it. On there, you'll find lots of great resources to help you grow in your faith and stay connected. And on there, there's also a digital Bible that you can use to follow along with this morning's message. And if you'd prefer a paper Bible, they're in the back of the auditorium and they are yours to take and keep. This morning, we're gonna be continuing our series in Acts chapter 25 and 26. So let's go ahead and turn there now to prepare for this message. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness. We pray that you would open our hearts and clear our minds to hear this morning's message. We love you, God. Amen. Sorry, moving a little slow this morning. Something about the time change. A few weeks ago, my wife, Teresa, was invited to kind of an impromptu uh, cookout, get together from an acquaintance of hers. She doesn't really know that person very well, didn't know anybody who's going to be there, but thought, you know, okay, I'll go just for a little bit and, and then come home. And, and so sure enough, she gets there, doesn't know anybody, and, and so tries to make small talk. And, and you know how it is, you know, you, you find somebody and you, okay, where do you live? You know, what do you do for a living? Oh, you have kids. Where do they go to school? Well, that question, where do your kids go to school, really set this woman off, uh, you know, because she started to tell Teresa, you know, listen, I'm just really concerned about our school system. Our school system is under assault right now from these Christians who are just trying to Christianize everything. And that society as a whole, we are under assault. We've got to do something to fight this off. Well, you know, Teresa, she's not a very confrontational person, so she's just trying to smile and nod her head along. The argument that our public schools are too Christian, not one you hear very often, uh, you know, and so she's like, all right, can we just like get through this? And, and finally they do, chat a little bit more, but then when you're a pastor's wife, there's a dreaded question that always comes. What does your husband do for a living? <laughs> Teresa just thought to herself, well, I'll never see this woman ever again, uh, <laughs> I share this story with you, not just because it's funny and I get some sort of sick humor out of it. Uh, I wasn't there. <laughs> but it confirms, I think, this common stereotype that whether right or wrong, that as Christians we have a reputation in our society, at, at least in American culture, that we are known more for what we are against than what we are for. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, for example... If our community says, hey, listen, those Christians at Chesapeake Church, they don't smoke crack because of their beliefs, I'm okay with that. You know, like, that, that's a good reputation to have. Growing up in the South, we would always say a Baptist, they don't dance, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do. <laughs> sometimes that was true, sometimes it was really not true. <laughs> but more seriously, I think just... Thanks to the various iterations of the culture wars over the last hundred years, Christians do have a reputation for always being against something. Whether it be Prohibition, the 1960s, the moral majority, Roe v. Wade, the list goes on and on of what society often believes about Christianity, that we are trying to take away the freedom and the fun of everyone around us. 
And I'm not saying this morning that the church shouldn't take a position on issues, that we shouldn't advocate for a just society that represents the holiness of our God. But instead, I'm just suggesting that we would focus more on proclaiming what we are for than what we are against. Last week, I pointed out how scholars have identified here, especially at the end of the book of Acts, that what Luke is doing in part is writing a defense for Christianity against both Jewish and Roman objectors. He's wanting to show how this way of Jesus really was the fulfillment of God's Old Testament promises through the law and prophets. And meanwhile, he wants to show that Christianity does not pose a violent threat to the Roman order, that the church should be treated with peace and tolerance. And and so we really saw those two elements on display last week in Paul's trials before the Jewish high priest and then the Roman governor at Caesarea. Our passage today could really be considered almost part two, but chapters 25 and 26 aren't just a repeat of what we covered last week. Luke adds one more element here in his defense of Christianity. He says that not only is Christianity completing the story of the Old Testament, not only is it a peaceful movement, but it is actually for the good of the whole world. In other words, the Christian faith isn't restrictive. It isn't oppressive, but it is the very best thing for all people and for all societies. And so in these two speeches today, Paul demonstrates how the resurrection of Jesus is exceedingly good news for every person and for all of society. Last week, we closed by reading that after two years had passed, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and because Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor, he left Paul in prison. Felix, the last Roman governor, essentially just says, all right, Festus, he's your problem now. And so now with this new Roman governor in place, the chief priests in Jerusalem are ready to try Paul all over again. And so under the guise of wanting to try Paul in Jerusalem, Luke tells us that the chief priests and leaders of the Jews presented their case against Paul to Festus. And they appealed, asking for a favor against Paul, that Festus summon him to Jerusalem. They were, in fact, preparing an ambush along the road to kill him. Now, Festus suspects these ulterior motives, and he says, no, I will try Paul again, but only here in Caesarea. Now, it's been two years, and so you have to imagine the priests have really kind of tightened up their case, added charges to what they're going to lay against Paul, and yet, verse 7, in Caesarea, they're able to prove, unable to prove anything of what they accuse Paul of. And so Paul's defense is fairly simple and clear. He says, neither against the Jewish law, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I sinned in any way. Essentially, Paul says, listen, I am neither anti-Jewish nor anti-Roman. And so Festus finds himself in the same predicament as his predecessor, Felix. He knows that Paul is innocent, but it would really help diplomatic relations with the Jews if he could just find a way to bring Paul to Jerusalem. And so verse 9, he proposes that. Well, might you be willing to talk more in Jerusalem? Paul replied, I am standing at Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. If I have done no wrong to the Jews, as even you yourself know very well, If I then have done any wrong and am deserving of death, I'm not trying to escape death. But if there is nothing to what these men accuse me of, no one can give me up to them. Here's the big moment. I appeal to Caesar. Then after Festus conferred with his counsel, he replied, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. Now, this is an extremely bold move of Paul. Under Roman law, any citizen had the right to appeal their case directly to the Roman emperor. But the risk is how is Caesar going to feel having to spend his time hearing this case about some random Jew in a little scuffle in a faraway city? In other words, this is very presumptuous of Paul to make this appeal. And it's a request that once made could not be undone. Paul has sealed his fate in one sense. To Rome, he will go in the custody of the Roman Empire. And I want to pause here because for three weeks now, we've been watching Paul make choices. 
watching Paul make decisions, trying to discern the Spirit of God. Two weeks ago, you remember, he was journeying to Jerusalem, but everybody was warning him not to go. And so two weeks ago, Seth walked us through how Paul was discerning the Spirit's will. Last week then, we see Paul entrust himself to Roman care, to Roman protection, even though it meant the loss of his freedom. And now he makes this choice to appeal to Caesar. He decides in this moment, this is how I'm going to get to Rome. And so I don't know about you, but for me, I just can't help but wonder, is Paul not taking matters into his own hands? Right? Is he, is he forcing God to do something here? And then on the other hand, well, there seems to be no other safe way for him to get to Rome other than by these means. Well, is Paul not trusting God to get him to Rome, though? Right? Why not have faith that God will protect him? Why not go back to Jerusalem? Well, the last time he was in Jerusalem, the Jews tried to kill him. And Paul, uh, or God had to intervene. You remember, he warned Paul's nephew about this. God rescued him already once. Should he really test God to do it again? Well, well, didn't Paul just hear the song that we were singing? Right? Did they not have Elevation Church back then? You know? I mean, of course God will do it again. My, my point, friends, is that in the Christian life, we all have times when it's not clear exactly what we should do. And Paul was no different. Jesus had told him that he would be a witness in Rome. But it's been two years now. I do think it's safe to say as an outside observer that Paul recognizes his safest position remains in Roman custody. And so by appealing to Caesar, that's the best way not just to get to Rome, but to witness directly to the emperor. In other words, Paul discerns now is the time to act. You see, sometimes when we're seeking God, when we're waiting for God to act, part of the answer is that, yes, he will act, but he will do so through us taking proper human responsibility, right? Sometimes in life, God's response is, no, wait and be still. Sometimes the answer is to act, to charge forward. And so how do you and I discern when to wait, when to act? Let me just give some some general thoughts here. It exceeds our time this morning to go into great depth. But just some some core principles that we should consider as Christians when decision making. First, examine God's word. I mean, that, that ought to seem obvious. But by examining God's word, we can get a sense for God's heart, for God's desire. Right? God's word didn't tell Paul explicitly whether to do this or not. But God had spoken to him about his calling to be a witness to Rome. The Bible may not tell us explicitly, take this job or don't take this job. Or or buy this house, don't buy that house. Or vote this way, don't vote that way. But the Bible does reveal to us the character of our God. The heart of our God. The desires that he has for his world and for his people. And so it's when we examine God's word that we can get a framework for who God is and what he desires to do in general. Second, again, obvious, but we need to pray about it. And and listen, God doesn't always respond to our prayers in the form of a burning bush. I really wish he did. The prayer is less about triggering God to speak to us as it is about conforming our will and our mind to his. It's in time of prolonged prayer where the spirit of God helps get us on his page. I can just tell you in my life, times when I really have been praying through a decision, and it just became clear what was of God and what was not. And God's answer hadn't ever changed. It was just in that process of prayer that he brought me into alignment with him. Third, we need to weigh our situations with fellow Christians. You know, not just to get their insight, their perspective, to get their prayers and and things like that. But I think we also need those fellow Christians sometimes to hold us accountable. Saying, Patrick, are you acting in the flesh or are you acting in the spirit? You know, I can be good at lying to myself and I need trusted brothers and sisters around me to be like, no, Patrick, that, that, that's you, man. That, that's not the Lord. Finally, fourth, we need to act in faith. And, and what I mean by that is what Paul says in Romans 14, 23, that everything that is not from faith is sin. 
And what Paul means here is that in times in our lives, we have to make decisions. And we may not know exactly if it's right or if it's wrong. But if we, if we have doubts, if we're unsure, and we do it anyway, we're not acting in faith in that moment. In other words, when I don't sense that this is the right thing for me, but I say, you know, but this is what I want to do, so I'm going to do it anyway, I'm not acting in the spirit. I'm acting in the flesh. And so any reservations, any hiccups that we have in our spirit, we need to trust those. We need to take those seriously, that we can only move forward in those decisions when we feel a sense of the peace of God in our lives. Now, ultimately, when it comes to any decision in our lives, I know that I can look back in my own life, professional and personal, and I can have regrets about things that I did or I didn't do. My wife will tell you I am really good at second-guessing myself on, on any decision that I make. But that's where also then finally understanding the sovereignty of God gives us peace. And when we talk about the sovereignty of God, we're just talking about the reality that our God is in control of all things. The Proverbs remind us that a person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his, his steps. I could go through the whole Old Testament, and we could go through story after story of, of, of how despite the shortcomings, despite the bad decisions, despite the failures of God's people, that God still always got his people where he wanted them. The reality is that sometimes we will discern the will of God rightly. Sometimes we won't. And so we should look back in our lives and say, how can I learn from that experience? You know, how can I improve in the future? But friends, whether God wanted to get Paul to Rome via the Romans, or whether he wanted to get Paul to Rome via another route, what do you know? God gets Paul to Rome. And in fact, we'll see next week how he intervened in so many ways to ensure Paul's safe passage. Friend, the God of all things is watching over your paths, and he will get you where he wants you to be. Now, returning to the text, it was quite an eventful first few weeks for this new governor. Not only is he dealing with the high priest, but we read next that now the Jewish king comes to make an official visit to him. The Jewish king who, oh yeah, for now a century had been appointed by the Romans. The king comes to do his uh, due diligence and make a formal visit to the new governor. Well, in this meeting, Festus expresses to King Agrippa confusion about Paul. Like, hey, while you're here, I got this guy, and I really don't know what to make of him. He's appealed to Caesar. I don't even know what charges to lay against him. Will you help me out? Because all I can tell is that this is all about some disagreements with him about their own religion and disagreements about a certain Jesus a dead man, Paul claimed to be alive. A dead man, Paul claimed to be alive. Yeah, that really is what it's all about. It's what we're going to be celebrating just in a few weeks. It is what is a scandal to the Jews and it is foolishness to the Greeks. Of course, it's not just about a dead man that we claim to be alive. It's about the meaning. It's about the implications of that resurrection. That's what changes the whole world. And so Agrippa agrees to meet this Paul and to hear him out, I think both out of a sense of curiosity as well as to maybe help Festus identify a charge. And so as we just turn the page to chapter 26, Paul now explains to Festus and to Agrippa why this dead man who is alive is such good news. Paul begins his defense with his own bona fides, if you will. He says that if there was ever a traditional orth, ultra-Orthodox Jew, hey, I was it. And it's not just that, but it's as he has said repeatedly over and over again, it's not just that he was it, he believes he is still it. Paul says, I haven't left Judaism per se. I am practicing its fulfillment. That's why we said back in Acts chapter 9, that you can't actually call Paul's experience on the Damascus Road a conversion because it's not like he went from one religion to another. In Paul's mind, he hasn't really changed. 
He has always followed and worshipped the one true God, the creator, the God of Abraham. Thus he says, I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors. The promise our 12 tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. This exact argument Paul makes in Galatians 3. How Abraham, our father, our ancestor, he was given a promise of blessing. And Abraham believed that promise. He believed God would give his descendants the whole earth. Abraham believed that God was going to bless all the nations, that he was going to bring justice and peace through his descendant one day. And so Paul is saying that descendant, that one, that promised seed has come and his resurrection from the dead signals the beginning now of God fulfilling those promises he made to Abraham long ago. And friends, that's not just an argument that Paul is making to his audience or that Luke is making to his audience 2,000 years ago. This is the very same message proclaimed to us that we need to receive today. And it is exceedingly good news for you, for me, for the whole world. Because the world is broken. The world is estranged from its creator. All humanity has turned its back on God. All humanity has rejected God to serve themselves. And by doing so, humanity has plunged this world around us into death, destruction, darkness. And we can just look at our own lives and we can see uh, illustrations of that in our own life, of how we live for ourselves rather than for our creator. But Paul says that the God whom we left has never left us. In fact, long before any one of us made a a culpable act of sin in our lives, before any one of us drew our first breath in this world, that God promised to rescue you and to rescue me. He promised to rescue this world, to come and to make his home with us and among us. And so what Paul is saying, friends, is that God has now done this. This process of new creation, it has begun. It is at work. And so just to illustrate that, Paul once more shares his testimony. And the fact that Luke records Paul's testimony now for the third time in this book ought to tell us something. Like maybe Paul's story is important. Especially when you consider what is added in this telling versus previous accounts. In other words, when Luke repeats the same story but includes something new, that new thing ought to really pop out at us. And that new thing is found in verses 17 through 18. But just before I touch on those verses, I also believe that this third mention of Paul's testimony shows each of us the importance of our own personal testimonies. And when we talk about a testimony, we're just talking about that story of what God has done in your life. That here's who I used to be. Here's how I lived. Here's what I cared about. And then here's what God did in my life. Here's how he intervened. Here's how he rescued me. Here's how he has made me new. And here is now how he is at work in my life. Right? Every Christian has a testimony of who you were, of what God did, and who you are now striving to be in him. And our testimonies are so important. We've been talking about this in my my small group, that for one, people respond well towards stories. Stories make sense to us. That rather than just coming out of the gate with all this doctrine, that our story, our testimony, is such a compelling way to present the gospel to someone who doesn't know Jesus. Moreover, on top of that, nobody can argue with your story of who you were and who you are now. And so we need to each be able to share that story. And I would just say, if if you don't think that you could share that just in three to five minutes, take some time just this afternoon to jot it down. Oh, this is who I was. This is what God did in my life. This is what God is doing now. And I would just say that if if you can't trace that story, if it's like, well, there's never really been a moment of change in my life. I've, I've, I've been trying to be a good person. I've been trying to be better. 
Well, then you need to ask yourself, have I really surrendered my life to the lordship of Jesus? You don't necessarily have to nail it down to an exact moment. But if we call ourselves Christians, we should be able to look back in our lives and see, wow, this, this is who I was all on my own. And this is who my God has made me to be and how my God has intervened to perform such a miracle in my life. Our testimonies are incredibly important. They're the most powerful tool I believe we have in sharing this good news of Jesus to the lost and dying world. Well, just returning then to Paul's testimony, as I said before, verses 17 through 18 really form the heart of his argument here. He's been claiming that his whole ministry, that which he is being accused for, it is simply the promise of God. That God said, I will set the world to rights, and that through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, God has begun that. And so Paul says that the Lord replied to me, I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We see that this process of redemption, this process of rescue, begins with a turn from darkness to light. One of the most uh, prominent motifs in the whole Bible. In fact, it's how the Bible begins. That God creates all things out of nothing. And into this dark void that he created, he speaks, let there be light. It was in the darkness of the Negev desert that God appeared to Abraham as a burning torch to make the promise of salvation. It was in the darkness of Sinai that God first appeared to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And he would lead his people out of bondage by a pillar of fire by night. It was in the darkness of the Judean countryside that God sent his light when his son was born in Bethlehem. God's mission is to shine light into darkness. The Apostle John writes that in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shine in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so when Paul says that God is turning us from darkness to light, he means that it's through the cross and through the resurrection of Jesus that we move from death to life. That in Jesus we are now reconnected with the very life for which God made us. A life that is abundant. A life that is full. We're not just talking about eternity. We're talking about living now a life of meaning. A life of purpose. A life of fulfillment. Second, this work of redemption and rescue is then pictured by Paul as freedom from Satan to God. Again, the earliest pages of the Bible recount this ancient conflict. That when God created man and woman, he gave them dominion over all of creation. That they were to rule over it, that they were to lead it in worship and obedience. But then Adam and Eve listened to the voice of the serpent. And by doing so, they gave up their dominion. They, they subjected themselves to the creation rather than the creator. And so Paul then tells us in Ephesians 2 that because of this, all humanity now follows the devil. All humanity is under Satan's leading. Jesus himself in the Gospel of John used the language of us being children of Satan because of our sin. And so just as the Israelites had found themselves in bondage to a wicked serpent-like king, all humanity lives under oppression today, under this evil ancient prince. But just as God demonstrated to Pharaoh that he alone is king, it's in the cross and in the empty tomb that God has declared his victory to the devil. Jesus said, now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. In Revelation 12 and 19, we see that by his death, Jesus has broken Satan's power to deceive the nations, that Satan cannot stop the salvation of this world. Right, catch this, the Bible is clear. We haven't just been freed then from Satan. We have now been freed to belong to our God. As the great theologian Bob Dylan once wrote, you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Jesus brings us to light. Jesus brings us to God. And thus, in this, Jesus has brought us the forgiveness 
of our sins, Paul says. Forgiveness is a judicial action. Like picture a courtroom. How we stand guilty of sin before our God. Guilty of cosmic treason, of disobedience, of idolatry. We are guilty. That's who we are. We deserve the guilty verdict. And yet our God looks at us and declares us innocent. Not guilty. Like that's remarkable. That's unfathomable. How? Well, it's because Jesus on the cross suffered the punishment of our guilt in our place. It's what it means to be ransomed. That Jesus by his blood has purchased us for God. It's how a holy and just God can look at a sinner like me and say not guilty. It's not like, hey, Patrick, I know you're a sinner. Don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. No, it is a big deal. And that's why I put it on my son in your place. You don't have to worry about your guilt, about your sin, about your shame, because Jesus has paid for it in full. He has purchased your soul and cleansed it with his blood. That's why I forgive you. It's in the cross that we receive that right to become children of God, that adoption, forgiveness from sin. And so Paul just says in conclusion to this king that it's in Jesus now that we receive a place with God. As Paul would write to the Colossians, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God intends to make his dwelling place with us. And guys, that's what he's been doing throughout the entire Bible. In the Garden of Eden, it was a place to dwell with his people. In the tabernacle, a place to dwell among and travel with his people. In Solomon's temple, a place to dwell among his people. And so that's why all this culminated when God himself became man and tabernacled among us. That Jesus has become that meeting place of heaven and earth. That in Jesus, God can now dwell in and with his people, and it will culminate one day when he brings his glorious city to this earth. Just how glorious this is, how beautiful, how amazing this case that Paul is making. And so as it is building and as it is reaching its climax, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, you're out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. The Roman governor shuts it down. Because this is no longer a trial. This is no longer an examination. This is turned into a church service. If Paul keeps preaching, uh uh-oh, everybody's going to get saved, and that will make matters even more complicated for Festus. And so he stops it all. And I think you feel that tension in Paul's final exchange with Agrippa. Paul replied, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? And and Luke just leaves it there, right? Luke doesn't really resolve this scene for us. That's because I want, I think he wants us to see that the only logical and right response is to surrender to Jesus. That's the only right thing that anyone could possibly do. And he says that not just to Festus, not just to uh, Agrippa, not just to the Jews, not just to the Romans. That's the point he is making to you and me today. That receiving the kingship and salvation of Jesus is the surpassingly greatest thing we could ever do for ourselves and for the world around us. And so friend, what is your verdict as you hear the gospel on trial and presented here? Is it to surrender yourself to this one true king? To receive forgiveness for your sins? To receive a new life? Christian, if you have made that moment, are you walking in the new life still today? Or has it just kind of become a part of your life rather than the dominating shape of all that you do? I think as we take communion this morning, what a beautiful illustration you have of what Jesus has accomplished for us, of rescuing us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to now belong to God 
forgiveness of sin obtained through his broken body, through his shed blood, that all of God's promises have now come true in Jesus. And so if you have surrendered your life to Jesus by faith, I would invite you to take this meal with us this morning as the elements come by in a second. But if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we just ask that you pass the place along. The Bible says this is for those who call themselves followers of Jesus. And so we're glad you're here. We just ask that you not take it past the plates along as they come. But just as we distribute the bread and as we distribute the cup in a moment, let's just pause, let's reflect, let's meditate upon this profound truth that in Jesus, God has come to make his dwelling with us now. That yes, one day we will enjoy it in full, but there's an abundant life he offers to us today. Are we receiving it? Are we walking in it? Let's distribute the bread. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way, he took the cup, shared it with his disciples, and they took it together.
Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we proclaim the death of your Son. That by his death we have received the forgiveness of our sins. We have received the right to become your children. And we proclaim that the grave could not hold him. That he rose victorious to declare to all of heaven and earth that your promise to make all things new, to set the world to rights, has begun. And so we can proclaim this morning the truth that Jesus will return to finish that process. And so we look forward to it, Father, in glorious anticipation. We ask your blessing and your guidance and your strength that we would serve your kingdom well until that glorious day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What a beautiful morning it's been. Easter at Chesapeake is so special because we get to come together and celebrate that our Savior has defeated death and risen from the grave. And it takes a lot of hands to make all these services happen, and that's where you come in. Serving is just one way that we show people the beauty and community in God's kingdom. And we want you and your family to be a part of that. Even if you have never served with us before, Easter is a great opportunity to get connected to a ministry through serving. And the cool thing about it is that you and your family can even serve together. One exciting new addition this year is our Easter greeters team, where you'll have the opportunity to greet our guests with signs and candy. You can sign up right now for our Easter serving team on our app or online at chesapeakechurch.org slash Easter. And remember, please be praying about who you could invite to Easter services this year. Easter is one of the easiest Sundays for that invite. All we have to do is ask. And now a quick reminder that we extended our food drive and today is the last day. And don't worry if you forgot to bring in a food donation this morning. You can still donate right now through our virtual food drive, which allows us to purchase food, at bulk, purchase food in bulk at a lower price than the grocery store. And you can do that right on our app by clicking the Give button in the bottom right-hand corner and tapping Food Drive. Or you can give online at chesapeakechurch.org slash connect. This is our opportunity to change the lives of people right here in our community. So thank you so much for being a part of it. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. And just like I said earlier, we would love the opportunity to meet you and help you get connected here. I will be out in the lobby with our connections team after service. And you can also connect with us online at chesapeakechurch.org slash connect. And now as we move into offering this morning, if, the, if you're new and this is your first Sunday with us, please do not feel any pressure to give. We are just so glad that you are here worshiping with us. If you do feel moved to give, we thank you and know that your giving will continue to build the kingdom here for Christ. And for those of us that call Chesapeake our home, we know this is our opportunity to worship God by returning to him that portion of all that he has blessed us with. And that's why the church doesn't take an offering. The people make an offering. You can drop your offerings in the bags as they pass by, or you can give right on our Chesapeake Church app. Just tap the give button in the bottom right hand corner. And another easy way to give right from your phone is to text Chess Church, one word, to 77977, and then follow the link to give online. And as we continue to worship this morning through our offering, this passage in Matthew reminds us that we are to be disciples and share the good news. Let's pray for our offering. Dear God, we just thank you for bringing us all together this morning. We thank you for the reminder of your goodness and your faithfulness. We pray that this, we pray and commit this offering to do your will and build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Yes, may that be our prayer this morning, that the Spirit of God would do that work in our lives, that we would live in full surrender for King Jesus. Next week, we'll continue in our series of the Book of Acts. Only two more weeks. I'm sad. You're probably excited, but only two more weeks as we lead up to Easter. A uh, reminder, our prayer team is down here. Some of our elders, some of our pastors as well. We want to pray with you. We want to talk about maybe anything that God has put on your heart this morning or that's happening in your life. And so come find us in the front. Let me close us in prayer. Father, we love you and we delight in your grace. Father, we celebrate your grace. We thank you, Father, that while we were your enemies, while we hated you, that Jesus died for our sins. And so, Father, I just pray by your Holy Spirit, we would know deeply and profoundly that truth, Father, and that you would work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. We love you. Send us on your mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week. information about Chesapeake Church, visit us at chesapeakechurch.org or follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook.